Sun Museum of Solar Cooking based in Minneapolis and I'm in Santa Cruz California sunny day sunny city uh, with Tom Hoffman with Solar Z and I'm gonna let him tell his story about the, the product that he's designed here and uh, where it fits into the whole world of, of solar cooking and the environment and and whatever else he wants to say so take it away and we've got the All right got some uh, pictures there to look at so yeah yeah all right so how I got started was I have a friend that's a school teacher and she was cleaning out her garage and I was visiting and she turned around and handed me one of these solar cookers it was actually the, the SCI solar cooker panel cooker and I said what's this she said well that's a solar cooker and she teaches in public schools so she was teaching this for quite a while and she says here take it and so I took it and I brought it home and I just totally got amazed I was just blown away by the whole idea that you could cook and that you could boil water in it and all the rest of that and as an engineer in science I was just like oh my goodness so I started playing around with it like many people have and you get all enthralled and everything and eventually I built I built a little oven uh, box oven out of a couple of cardboard boxes and I played with it for about two or three years and I couldn't I, I started to really I started to cook in it quite a bit I started to realize that that uh, I could literally really cook things and have meals so I was cooking and then as a scientist and engineer I started collecting data and trying to trying to figure out you know what could I put in it like like so many people have done a great job doing and after about a couple of years, I kept asking myself, why aren't we seriously using this on the planet? I mean, seriously using it. And in about 2004, which was around that time, I realized that it's really, really not very usable as a portable. It's, it's too cumbersome. It's like you're, you're walking around with stuff, trying to open doorknobs. You're trying to figure out where to set your oven. Um, you just can't, it, it's just too difficult to use. For a hundred years, people have been talking about making this an appliance. But as an engineer and a scientist that's worked formally in the Silicon Valley and stuff, I'm going, this just needs to happen. So I decided I would really work on it and say what needs to happen. And clearly, without a doubt, the first thing that comes up is you cannot leave the kitchen. You just cannot leave the kitchen. If you're going to compete with these other products, you have to, you got a microwave oven, you got a toaster oven, you have to compete with that. And you're not going to be able to, to uh, uh, have something that, that you have to go outside, you have to do all this stuff with. So is that possible? And as soon as I realized, you know, if you could, if you could bring the sun in, I, talk, I thought about the roof, a dumb waiter, changing buildings, all the stuff that probably everyone else has thought about over and over again for such a long time. But I decided that there's a way to do it in an individual product that you can put in a box and you can ship. But you really, to, you have to get the flexibility, the universal flexibility to create an environment to where if you're facing east, if you're facing south, if you're facing west, you can get sun. And I can go into a lot of detail that's been worked out as to how that works and some of the magic that's in that. But essentially, it, it needed to really become an appliance. And we have so many tools like automation, materials engineering, and design to, to uh, bring this from the portable level. But it's 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 kind of a daunting task to figure out how to look at seasonal changes, to look at um, building positions, to look at um, um, being outdoor weathered, what it looks like to the customer. I mean, you pull all those together and I've got reams and reams of information that's probably too long for this talk, but I just started working on every one of these individual things. And today now, 
I mean, I had a fish pole out there and I was trying to rotate it with a fish pole, uh, you know, trying to deal with all of these low tech issues that it seems like when you talk with people, it's like, well, you know, it's too costly or it's, it's you know, you just lower the cost. It's too, it's got, can't handle the weather. You figure out how to well, handle the weather. Um, and so it just started coming together. I started in 2004 and now we're at 2020, 2021. And there's a, now a beta unit product that's come out of manufacturing that is going to be part of this video here, okay? And so the idea is, is to break, uh, to approach this shift. This is an inflection point in the modern age. The whole world has become, the whole world has become modern. The whole world, 7 billion people on the planet that, that need, to, need to cook. Um, we're here, but it's going to require that we do formal engineering, that we require going into the deeper science of it and the manufacturing of it. And so what I've proven thus far with the Solar Z is it's manufacturable and we have a product here. So requirements like three cardinal directions, um, that's tough. Automatic sun tracking. Um, all of these things that we've all talked about for so long are, are a lot of them are in this Solar Z and they're working. Um, and I could go into those details, but it's a much longer talk, you know, slides and so forth. But for now, um, so the other thing I want to mention here is, is that kind of how, how do you get something at an inflection point to happen? Well, there's this, there's this concept that they talk about when you research marketing, it's called the technology push versus the market pull. That technology push is different than a market pull. A market pull definition is when you have a product and you, the customer is sort of pulling on it with new features. Like for example, an automobile, you got to like a fancier tailgate or you're adding something in or you're, you're kind of the customer it's sort of getting pulled along by the market. A technology push is a whole other animal. And a technology push, you might call it disruptive. The automobile, when it first came out, people said, hey, we have horses. Uh, the microwave oven, oh, well, I don't need that. You know, they're on and on. The cell phone, it's on and on. So the technology push, like the PC, you are trying to approach your customer differently. You're trying to push it into the market as a new thing. So what's happening, in my view, that makes this inflection point not really happening going into the appliance, is, is that we're waiting for a technology, or, or, uh, a market pull. Waiting for the market pull. Now, what does the customer want? Well, I don't know how it looks. You know, waiting for that pull, waiting for that pull. But frankly, you know, you look at Elon Musk and the electric car, let's do it. So the technology push is more based on the idea, you build it and they will come. Like the PC got pushed into the market. People said, well, what, and what was their appliance com competition? The typewriter, the, uh, uh, the graphics, you know, there were different ways to do graphics on T-squares and boards and stuff. So how did that happen? Well, it turns out what's missing, I think, in the solar oven industry and in the technology itself is this interface problem. The interface problem is huge. And back at Park Research Center, when um, they were working on they actually created the 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 MUI, the MUI GUI story, I call it, the, the 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 graphic user interface. That team understood that there were these two systems. You had this PC, this machine that did everything it needed to do, and more. And people wanted to use it, engineers and scientists. And they were like, ah, I, it's just not usable. It takes more time than it does. But yet, people were working on it, trying to make it more powerful and more powerful, and more powerful. But then this research center says, it's got the power. 
And then Stephen Jobs comes along and goes, that's the answer. And then in his interview in the documentary, they're interviewing him and they got the camera on him. And he says, oh my goodness. He goes, I, I got this call because they were going to sell it. And the engineers were mad because management was going to sell it at Xerox. But he went to that thing and you can see that interview. And he says, I went to see it because they were going to sell it to me. And he goes, I, first of all, and he said the door opened about two-thirds of the way or a third of the way. And he says, I could sit around the corner about 20 feet away. There it was. And he goes, I can't believe that I'm standing here and this is going to happen and change the whole planet. And it was the, the GUI, the graphic user-friendly interface that made the difference. So when you have two cells or two, any two systems in systems engineering, they have to interact and interface. And without that, it, it just can't happen and they stand alone and they just kind of move along and then they either fizzle or not. So what we need to do is we need to start to seriously work on the interface. So it's called the Mooey Gooey story because now you fast forward today. You've got this incredible machine that we teach in public schools. All around the country, teachers are teaching solar oven. It's this machine that does everything we want. And we go, well, who's working on the interface? You know, we're walking around with pots and they're spilling and trying to open doorknobs and walk downstairs and trying to figure it all out. So that interface needs to happen. So the Mooey. The mechanical user interface is what Hoffman Enterprises is doing to the solar oven to get it to be user friendly. One of the problems that I think takes place with this interface that, the, that, the, that we need to change in this inflection point is some of these things seem so low tech that they're kind of boring and they're not worth working on. We all love to have fun with, you know, the mirrors and everything, but what about making the weathering up at high tech. You know, what kind of painting are you going to put on so it lasts 30 years for a car? You know, what about figuring out how, how, what the reach is to go out of the, you know, into the oven? You know, uh, you know, so a lot of interface problem is low tech stuff that people don't, it's kind of boring or it seems simple. It yeah, doesn't get you to Lubeck be... Lubeck has the phrase, he doesn't you know, want the... I don't want a human being getting in the machine. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, machine should, the machine should be, you know, set it and forget it. Uh, right. Have, have the, the control should be like no-brainers. I mean, you, you forget that you even turn it on. Right. And it works. I mean, so. we need to make the solar oven in the modern kitchen environment. Cooking with sunlight in the modern kitchen mainstream in as many households as possible is the goal of T.M. Hoffman Enterprises. Um, you know, and there's got to be creative ways instead of saying, well, it's too costly, we can't do it, or it's going to be weathered. We need to say, for example, at MIT, the team that's working on the flying car. There's a whole documentary and interview on that that's absolutely fascinating. But there's subtlety to these simple things that are interface things that we're kind of shying away from because engineers love technical things and like to work on these complicated things. But the flying car, this woman, I forget her name, was being interviewed, and she says, we're, we're trying to make, for years and decades, we've been trying to make a flying car, and we as a team figured out we were going about it all wrong. Why would you ever want a car to fly when you have an airplane that already drives? So the team started realizing, you trying to make a car fly is like, an impossible mindset. I mean, it just won't fly. But you got this other machine that actually drives and flies and taxis and does everything you want. And all you got to do now is do a market pull and start spiffing it up. So she said, when we came across this at MIT, we were blown away because it opened us up. And so now all we got to do is take the transmission and add a few more gears. We got to get more suspension so we can go 50 instead of 20 or 30 in the taxi. But the airplane's already there and all the dynamics are done. Why are we reinventing that? They have made leaps and bounds into the driving airplane. You don't want a flying car. You want a driving airplane. And they show it going down the residential road. You fold, wings are easy to fold up. You put a hinge on them. You pull them in. 
So my point, my point about this is, is we need to, as an industry and as scientists and engineers working on this, we need to start to open up to real creative ways to looking at these simpler, subtle ideas and, and not necessarily try and get another degree of temperature and mirrors and everything, but start to look, I mean, that's good stuff and we got to keep that going. But doing things right is not the same as doing the right things. Okay, so the user friendliness of our current industry just isn't there and it really has to be, and, and the Solar Z proves that it is all doable. The Solar Z handles three cardinal directions. The Solar Z will track the sun without any feedback. The Solar Z, um, you know, can do four cardinal directions depending upon where you are. But who measured it? You know, who's measured how far away from the building do you need to be to get sunlight in four directions? Well, I have, you know, I'm not going to look for them now, but that's all in my presentation. I have those experiments and I actually measured the data. And so at 37 degrees latitude in Santa Cruz in the summer on July 8th, I can cook in four cardinal directions with the Solar Z. And all of that information, it just hasn't been measured. It's being wrote off in the mind before we're actually working with it. What I like about Elon Musk is execute, execute, give me the data, and let's get this, let's really figure out where is the creative solution within that. I mean, he's landing those rockets. All through history, we have paid for things and we've had to develop things and really make them decent, including the PC. That had to become not just a mainframe, but an encapsulated thing that worked really well. That was the Macintosh. See, so you can't expect people to pull in something you don't, you haven't already thought through all these issues and actually executed and built them. There's timing to this. You have to do the things that you need to do. And so all that great work is done and those ideas are all over the place and there's some wonderful stuff going on and it's awesome. But if that's all we do, we're not scaling up. We're like the PC is stalled. And so my take is, is, is that the hard job, and I've had some engineers and then they kind of walk away and they're a little bit like, well, that's impossible. It's like, how do you put 50 pounds of weight? You put a 35 pound oven with 25 pounds of food six feet out from a pivot point on the wall. Well, that's all doable. I mean, we got bridges that are built that are doing all sorts of amazing things. But if you if you kind of like keep going after all these peripheral accessories. So in 2004, I'm looking and going, I, I wouldn't want to use it. I mean, as much as I love solar oven, I get up in the morning or I'm, I'm tired or I got to eat food. I don't want to use a portable. And I, I don't think I'm that much different. I'm not a cook or a chef or anything, but that idea that you are creating all these other things because you're kind of moving away from the issue of I need a team of people we weren't pulling together a team of people where an engineer a couple of engineers will work on weathering I mean we're talking paint we're talking materials uh, the solar Z is cut this big you know the four big panels and it cooks great I've cooked hundreds and hundreds of times in that thing it's that prototype has been out there for three years as a beta unit out of a factory and if you go to my site you can look at the pictures in, in the, on the wiki site um, but the weathering getting getting the panels to fold up and are gonna, you know I mean we're doing this with you know the, the James Webb telescope folding it all up I, you know and I'm not you know, I come at things kind of slow, so all these ideas, I'm pulling this together. But with a team of people, we can fold up those panels, it'll tightly fold up, it'll go into storage better. All the stuff that people don't like and they have a hard time with, yes. And Elon Musk isn't shut down of, well, we want fancier fenders or we want kind of, you know, I'm not shut down to that. But, but. But you better have your priority straight that you need to get 300 miles on the battery or nobody's going to want it. I need 500. <laughs> you need 500. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like setting a list of priorities. Sure. At this point, I could go into another story, which is, have you heard of drawdown? Uh, the term, I've heard the term, but yeah. explain it. It's yeah. a book, New York oh, Times sure, sure. bestseller. 
that that came out and I got it up here on the slide, but it's a list of 80 things that are being done on the planet. And what the experts in our world are seeing is we're all just kind of moving around like herding cats. But when you collect the data, from 1 to 80, they ranked everything in what effect of CO2. Period. And I think that this might be the time to pull up that chart and we can actually look at it. So... This is a New York Times bestseller. When I saw this, this out of all, I mean, I've read a lot of stuff and I'm like a lot of people in our industry looking at all these different ways, but this made sense about doing things right is not the same as doing the right things. I teach my kids that, you know, when I have students. And so when you look at this drawdown, what they realized in Paul Hawking is like, we're all just kind of doing everything, but what, what is the data that says, what would you put number one on the list of, has the biggest percent effect on CO2? And what has, you know, how are they ranked all the way down? They, they did it from one to 80. And you went all around the world and everybody's going, yeah, we, we don't even have a list. So they're calling this the greatest, most comprehensive plan. And all it is is a list from one to 80 for CO2 of the percent effect for CO2. So what I do in my presentations when I give talks is I'm saying, and nobody's got this 100%. If I say, what's number one on that list? No one's even close. If I say number three, no one's close. If I say number 46, they're blown away. This is all based on raw data. So I kind of tout people along and, and make people realize we, we don't even know the effect just for CO2, we got a lot of other effects we got to worry about too. But these are experts around the world. Well, the first, here's the list. Number one, 80 billion tons of, it's tonnage of CO2 carbon in the air. Number right. one is refrigeration. Bar none, bar none, it's refrigeration. So let me, I need to get the list in front of me so I can see it and I'll explain these to you because it's worthwhile. And this is the point I want to make about our industry is we need to do the things that matter for, the, for solar cooking. So number one is they got categorized energy, materials, transport, and buildings and cities. So they got a series of categories. Right. So number three, what would number three be? It is known, without a doubt, number three is reduced food waste. We threw away 50%, about 45 to 46% of the food in this nation from our plates. We just throw it away. Number six, educating girls and women, 59.6. What's, where are solar ovens and solar cooking on this list? It's number 21, clean cook stoves. And it doesn't even take in solar cooking because when I go to that section on clean cook stoves, they give a little two-page burp. It's not even taking that in. We're destroying the planet with cooking and with food waste. But it's 21. It's in the top 25% of everything done is solar this, cooking. This is pure Pareto. The, the 20 Eighty percent of the problems are caused by twenty percent of the sources. That is this a is pure Pareto. Yes. The Pareto principle. Yes. 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 Yeah. So the first twenty-five percent of this. So then I say, well, where's trucks? Where's cars? Where is recycling in your kitchen, which everybody is willing to do? Now these are experts, world-known. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, 51. Cars is 49 on the list. So I can go on and on, but it's 1 to 80, and I'm saying to everybody, we need to really, really look at this. And it's, I have gone through so many things, and, and we're all just kind of wandering around doing these pieces. But it's kind of what I've learned in engineering. It's called the percent effect. When you do a project, you have plenty on your plate. And you can get off on all of these things. They become red herrings, even though they're valid. You know, I'm not taking away, you know, the stuff you need to learn about customer life. Everything that I hear, I bring in. 
but I also say, well, that ain't going to happen right now because the 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 car can't fly like an airplane. So that's the drawdown effect, which I think is very important to this inflection point we need to do with solar cooking. I mean, you know, you can kind of, as you analyze it, you can get into these different details of like, well, it doesn't account for this sure. and it doesn't account for that. But, you know, the big hitter is the dirty modern kitchen. But we have damaged, and we go unseen in this kitchen. The microwave oven, the toaster oven, the, I mean, the burning of the fuels and everything. And yet, we're not, we don't have something today. This is an inflection point. I just say it over and over again that if solar cooking is going to become something, it has to move into the modern environment. The whole world is becoming modern. Don't stop the incredible work that's going on, though. That's not an issue. But we are not expanding into this other zone. And I hope to get investors and serious investors, millions and millions of dollars, teams of people, to make solar cooking really happen and be as ubiquitous, possibly, as the microwave oven. And what we have today, and there's, there's intellectual property, so I can't share everything, but the controller, you push the buttons, you set your dials, you walk away, it automatically shuts off at the end of the day, and it tracks the sun. And when you come back, your food is done, and you call it back. And you saw that in the video. This, it's in this video. So all of that is there at a doable level. It's doable. All products have to compete with the, with the products that they previously had. And the only way to do that is to execute with hardware. That beam goes out there. It goes out there a certain distance for a reason. And then all of this, you start to understand the problem when you start to actually do this without just shutting your mind off. So it, it Dean came and I hope someday, and I'm looking at doing this because this is such a push and I'm having a hard time getting people to really listen to this, is to talk with Dean Kamen uh, as one of my people and to Elon Musk because they're pushing and they, we probably have a really good discussion because you, you, you see the inflection. And by the way, everybody knows that See, everybody knew the PC. Everybody knows the electric car. Everybody, we teach solar oven to kids. And yet, here I sit as an engineer, and I don't have something that I can't run just with a few knobs like other appliances. Well, I can now. But I am listening to everything coming in. And if you listen and you don't prioritize, you're overwhelmed and you shut down. Sure. But... I don't know if you noticed, but that's that. there's a solution there that operated, and it's in that video. It needs to be cleaned up, you know, or the folding of the collector panels, you know. So a good place to keep going here that might be interesting is, is the list of requirements. When I started doing this in 2004, yes. formally nailing the requirements. Three cardinal directions minimum. I got to go out 30 feet from the building. You're you're reaching out to get the sun, and then you're trying to bring it in. And the reason the goal is cooking with sunlight in the modern kitchen. I'm not. We're not narrowed to this whole thing just being a Solar Z product and all the rest of that. This is like one solution to a very complex issue. So what I was going to say earlier was is. A net second requirement was is you don't tear apart your building to put it in. Um, um, that it has to handle all different seasons, and it has to handle that minimum three cardinal directions. And then there's all these phenomena that I'm finding. Hoffman Enterprises is finding phenomena, which I've ta talked with Paul Funk and with Alan Bigelow, about the difference in the temperature that that round temperature gauge you got is 30 degrees different than the thermocouple. And I've got a whole story there. This is part of this presentation. Or why is the rays hotter in the winter than the summer? All around the planet. And I could see that in the solar oven, and that was an argument for 10 years or a decade until I finally found it. It's 7%.
And that doesn't matter what season you are, or what latitude, or what hemisphere you're in. It's because we're on an ellipse where the sun is. And it's 7%. So I can cook as well when there's frost on the ground as when it's 90 degrees. So these things, you're trying to break through, and a lot of times they just end up being arguments. But what we do here at Hoffman Enterprises is data, data, data. You know, it's like you're executing so you're making it happen. So when I say the sun, does the sun, is sun moving at a constant velocity in the azimuth direction? No, not at all. You know, but I can explain it. That, that you know, when you go to Einstein's theory of relativity, it's a frame of reference. So when I'm standing at a road that I can see 20 miles this way in Nevada and 20 miles this way in Nevada, what I'm wondering about is the solar Z. I'm not getting all wrapped around seasons and changes and this and that. So you're sitting here, and from the solar Z's perspective or your perspective, when you turn your head and you look down there, and you're looking at that car coming, you're watching it come at you, how much is your head turning? Hardly at all, if any. Hardly at all, if any. And as it gets to you, it's like the Doppler effect, as it gets to you. By the time that sun is coming up, it's moving, and your head's moving, that car's going by, you're moving, and then your head stops moving. That's the relativity in the understanding of the problem of the solar Z. So when I talk with people, I go, the sun's not constant. You, you get into all these technical arguments. It's like, well, no, it, it, it's not constant from what you're trying to solve, understanding the problem. It's from the frame of reference. So I can show you that it's 15, you know, you're, you're basically averaging when your head's hardly turning about 15 degrees an hour. And by the time you get to here in the summer, it's 40. Just an azimuth velocity. Then it slows back down again. So you're trying to really understand the technical problem that you're trying to solve within the, the story or the perspective that you're in. And because we're not formally going into all these little areas, or we think that they're red herrings when they're really not, we're really not getting very far. We're sort of stunted. And again, I think that we have a lot to go with to break this inflection point. Sure. Briefly back to pull versus push, uh, pull having some value. Mm -hmm. uh, what what uh, what are you researching as far as what people do want? And so it would be the pull that you could at least justify the push that you do. Yeah. <laughs> and I mentioned I mentioned the thermocoupler yeah, with the maintaining the temperature of uh, where people. I set my oven at uh, 240 for ribs in the house, but I set it at 375 for bread. And so, uh, it, it, and there's a lot of chatter about that on the world network of solar cookers on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Stan Wells, who has come up with this tracker, then at least that's probably the yeah. good little thing that Sharon Claussen has mm -hmm. referred to. Uh, that's exactly what he's done: is he set it so he can have, have two degrees difference, four, eight, ten, where if he wants 220 and it's 221, it just turns away from the sun. Yeah. And when it gets down to 218, it turns back. Yeah, I think I saw yeah. that. Maybe. So something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, if that's if, if that's to me that speaks to pull because everyone on the world network that's the most popular discussion item. People chiming in saying, "Boy, this is great," the, and I think it speaks to the fact that I think people do want that one little extra yeah. piece of control. I mean, market so, pull never goes yeah, away, yeah, and right. so so you yeah. can work on this temperature thing, and you 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 know what we do here is we bring that in mm -hmm. and we log it in. Yeah, we log it in. And the more people we can work on this stuff, that's fine. But see, it becomes this priority. The priority right now is number 46, the car, at 7 <laughs> gigatons instead right. of the... Everyone's focused on that instead you know, of and so, But yep. yet, what you're concerned about and I'm concerned about is the planet. Where's the percent effect? So I would say to you, this is not the right timing to be putting a huge amount of resources and energy in that when we don't have anything that people really want to use. Or they want to use it, they just can't, like the PC. Once we get past that, all that stuff's going to come into play and have at it. We want it. 
So I record all that. But my team, just like Stephen Jobs did, you know, when he went from Apple II to the Macintosh in that documentary, he stopped people from working on it because they get all hung up in it. And we've got to change directions now. So doing things right, doing the things that really matter in time. You know, there's four dimensions to the universe, not three. And the fourth dimension gets left out. And that's what it feels like. The fourth dimension's left out in solar cooking. It's like we're working on all these temperatures and everything. And that's, people say they know what they want. I'll bet you out to say in a video, who knows what they want? That was proven with, with these constant disruptive industries. People don't know what they want. But you present them with something, but you can get a real feel for the big things that are missing. So what I'm saying is all this energy is going into that, and I would like to grab about 10 or 20 people that are working on all this and say, just focus on how you're going to protect that beam and weathering. You people work on folding up those panels, but those requirements of cooking and doing everything in the modern kitchen at your fingertips will never go away. And if you can't handle it as an engineer, I'll have to find somebody that can. Because you can't, you know, an engineer say, well, you can't be all things to all people, and he went out the door. It's like I just gave you a messy problem. Engineering has a lot of messy, messy, simple Low tech, which tends to be kind of interface problems, not totally, but that interfacing, it's like, uh, you know, mm, yeah, mm, mm, you know, and it's like that is hard to solve. I've been, I've got started in 2004, and I would love to show you just the scheduling of tracking 25 different avenues of all these different issues to resolve each one going down the path to say, can we land this rocket now? You know, can we get this in the kitchen? And some of them, like opening the door on the Solar Z one and a half inches from the window. Because making sure that the, no matter what size window you have, you can load that oven. That, after a few years, I finally figured that out, and it's a very simple idea. And when you see this, when people see it, they're like, well, that's a no-brainer. But it wasn't. Seems like a no-brainer that, you know, trying to make a car fly versus, you know, an airplane drive. Seems like a no-brainer. And once you tell everybody, it's like, oh, okay. But see, that, you know, being able to keep a vision of that. So my take is, I want Paul Munson's oven to not be on the shelves. And I want it everywhere. You know, that to me is the hard part. And I think we can get there. And so I've identified what I think it is. I think it's the interface. This, thank you so much. I mean, this has been wonderful. I mean, I, I, I'd love to go a few more hours.